Hi, my name is Professor Mamas Mamas from Kiel University and I'd like to welcome you to this uh, Medscape special event um, from the ACC in New Orleans. Today I'm going to talk about uh, the three or four most interesting trials that I think are really going to change practice. So first and foremost, the first trial which I'm going to discuss is the Apple Heart Study. This is a very interesting study. So the Apple Heart Study was undertaken in the United States and it's enrolled over 400,000 individuals that possessed an Apple Watch. So the first study I'd like to talk about is the Apple Heart Study. This is an important study, not because of the results, but rather in how we undertake clinical trials. So the Apple Heart Study was a single arm prospective study that enrolled over 400,000 adult patients in the United States. And the primary focus of this was to evaluate um, irregular notifications, but also to look at um, the association or between the irregular notifications and um, documented AF from a patch. So the way that these um, researchers undertook this trial was to use information derived from the Apple Heart Watch and particularly the irregular notification um, facility of this. In the patients um, that had irregular notifications, uh, which were around 2,500 out of 400,000 patients, these individuals were sent an ECG patch. And um, of the ones that had an ECG patch, around 450 returned the ECG patch for further analysis. So that's 450 patients out of a total of 400,000 patients. This was an interesting study because um, around close to 150 patients um, had documented AF. And in those where there was documented AF on the ECG patch, the positive predicted uh, value for the, the um, abnormal pulse notification was around 80%. You may say, well, you know, why is this an important study? After all, several million pounds or dollars have been spent in 400,000 patients just to detect around 150 episodes of AF. Surely there's a better way of um, identifying AF. I think this is an important study um, for a number of reasons. So first and foremost, I think it will change how we undertake studies. It took only nine months to recruit a one in 600 adult patients in the United States. This is you know, amazing. You know, no other study can have such a rapid and large recruitment of patients in such a short period of time. I think um, cardiology and other medical specialties are moving towards e-health. And so using information from wearable devices, I think, is very much the way forward. Will this impact on clinical practice? I don't think so. I think it's more around um, thinking about how we structure trials and looking at the feasibility of using information from e-health and also thinking about how this information will be actionable. The next area that I think really will be practice changing is around TAVA and its use in aortic stenosis. So randomized controlled trials have uh, driven changes in practice, particularly in TAVA. And we've gone from um, non-surgical um, candidates to high-risk surgical candidates to intermediate risk candidates. And all of these trials have shown at least equivalence compared to the gold standard, which is surgical aortic uh, valve replacement. So two trials have been presented at the ACC, uh, the PARTNER-3 trial and uh, the Evolute Low Risk trial. So talking about the PARTNER-3 trial, this was a randomised control trial of 950 patients with severe aortic stenosis that were considered low risk and low risk defined by the STS score with a predictive mortality of less than 4%. These were randomised to surgical aortic valve replacement versus a balloon expandable Sapien 3 valve. And the patients were randomized in a one-to-one -one setting. The primary endpoint was death, stroke, or all-cause hospitalization. And secondary endpoints were death, stroke, um, new AF um, at 30 days. Associated with the uh, TAVA or SAVA, there were surgical or PCI revascularization. And this was around 13% in the SAVA arm and 6.5% in the PCI arm. The trial was initially um, structured around non-inferiority and there was a secondary analysis of superiority. And interestingly, um, these were both met. So for the primary endpoint in the uh, SAVA group, this was 15.1% in surgery and in the TAVA group, it was 8.5%. This was both non-inferior and superior. 
There was other interesting factors. So, for example, in length of stay, TAVA was much shorter um, in terms of major bleeding complications. Again, far less in TAVA. Um, but pacemaker implantation, the rates were greater in TAVA. Um, and also the degree of um, mild um, aortic valve uh, uh, paravalvular leak was also greater in the TAVA arm. So it's about one in three patients had this. So the second uh, TAVA trial was the Evolute trial. This was a trial using a self-expanding um, Medtronic valve, um, either the core valve, the Evolute R, or the Evolute Pro. The primary endpoint was death or uh, disabling stroke at 24 months, and there were a number of different secondary endpoints, which were various composites of um, either vascular complications, major bleeds, strokes, acute kidney injury, um, prosthetic. Uh, valve dysfunction, prosthetic valve um, thrombosis, and so forth. A total of 1,468 patients were randomized, although interestingly, 24-month follow-up was only available in 72 patients in the TAVA arm and 65 patients in the surgery arm. And the mean follow-up of this study was 12.2 months. The primary endpoint was met in 5.3% of patients in the TAVA arm and 6.7% of patients in the surgery arm. Um, the new onset AF at 30 days was 7.7% in the TAVA arm and 35.4% in the surgery arm. So clearly this trial was non-inferior um, and there was much less uh, new onset AF. So we have two trials showing either equivalence or superiority of TAVA compared to SAVA. How will this change our practice? Well, I think very much, you know, the data is now limited um, to one year for the Partner 3 trial and two years for the um, Evolute trials. I think in the longer term, you know, we don't know how these valves will function. You know, we don't have 10-year follow-up data in this low-risk population. And so, you know, this is often going to be a very difficult and challenging choice for the interventional cardiologist or the surgeon. You know, do you go with um, a technology that has very good short-term results? Or do you um, consider using uh, the gold standard, which is surgical aortic valve replacement? I think the other thing to think about is the average age of the patients. In both trials, the average age was 75 years old. I think, you know, in much younger patients in their 60s, in my opinion, I would probably um, refer them for surgery rather than a TAVA trial. In both of these um, trials, there's going to be follow-up for 10 years, and I think it's going to be really interesting to see whether there's late catch-up, whether um, SAVA has better outcomes in the longer terms, or whether the equivalence of TAVA persists over time. So watch this space. I think the last bit is the Augustus trial. The last trial I'd like to talk about is the Augustus trial. So the Augustus trial was a 2 by 2 factorial design. Um, which was a randomized control trial in patients with atrial fibrillation, either having an acute coronary syndrome or undergoing PCI. Why is this trial important? Well, it's important because um, about one in 10 patients undergoing uh, PCI will have in, um, atrial fibrillation, and about um, one in 10 to one in eight patients with an acute coronary syndrome have atrial fibrillation. And it's very challenging in these patients to manage them. Why? Because these patients have increased risk of thrombotic complications, but treating them because of their requirements for anticoagulation has meant that they also have increased risk of bleeding complications. And so the challenge is, how do we manage these patients? So the Augustus trial aimed to answer this. This was a two by two factorial design, and it was comparing apixaban with a vitamin K antagonist, and also comparing aspirin versus placebo. And these were patients with atrial fibrillation or AS, um, AF, so again, this was in patients with AF undergoing PCI or patients with an acute coronary syndrome. The primary outcome was a major or clinically relevant uh, non blature bleeding, and there were a number of secondary outcomes, including bleeding complications as well as safety endpoints around the ischemic perspective. This trial recruited over 4,600 uh, patients into it. And clopidogrel was used as the um, antiplatelet in over 92% of patients. So in terms of the primary endpoint um, for apixaban, um, this um, was 10.5% of major bleeding complications compared to 14.7% of major bleeding complications with the vitamin K antagonists. So certainly there was superiority 
um, of the epixodon arm. In terms of aspirin, the major bleeding complications were 16% in the aspirin arm versus 9% um, in those patients receiving placebo. And the highest rate of bleeding was in those patients receiving a vitamin K antagonist, warfarin and aspirin, in close to 19% of patients. So one in five patients had a bleed. And the lowest risk was apixaban versus placebo, which was 7.3%. So many of the news outlets have reported that, um, you know, this is great, you know, patients don't need aspirin and so forth. But I think we need to delve a bit deeper into the trial. So for a start, um, the safety endpoints for ischemic uh, complications were really underpowered to detect um, small but relevant um, outcomes. And certainly if you look at things like stent thrombosis, then you'll see that there is a very um, big trend, but not significant towards uh, worse um, outcomes in the placebo arm compared to the aspirin arm. I think the second point to bear in mind is that um, these patients were recruited between a week and two weeks um, after their index event. So that means that these patients would have received aspirin for that week or two weeks. I mean, the average um, time to recruitment was around a week. And don't forget that many of the adverse outcomes in these patient groups occur early on. So for example, stent thrombosis will occur early on. And so you're removing the highest risk population I think this is an important trial, however, um, because certainly it is going towards the direction of travel in that less is more, you know, so overburdening these patients with dual antiplatelet therapy and anticoagulation is associated with worse outcomes from the bleeding perspective. And I think we have to bear in mind, and now that we're seeing more and more elderly patients, this will certainly impact on our practice. Final um, thoughts about the ACC. I think this has been a really superb meeting. I think that we have a number of really key, important practice changing trials that inform us how the future of clinical trial design is going to be, but also trials that will um, change how we treat elderly patients with AF, with aortic stenosis. I think it's been very interesting from a social perspective, you know, the, uh, now the ACC have introduced childcare facilities, which I think is a good thing. It increases um, the ability of individuals to attend these meetings. And there have been some really fantastic women in cardiology sessions as well, um, highlighting the challenges uh, faced by women in cardiology and discrimination. Unfortunately, many of these um, interesting sessions have been at the periphery and it would be nice to see them uh, more ingrained um, centrally within the main programme. So I'd like to thank you for joining us on Medscape UK and I hope that you will be able to comment on what your uh, favourite trials have been in the ACC. Thank you.